be here. Let me see. We got 80 people in the meeting. That's awesome. I've known about this meeting for a while. Maria, well, when, when Maria moved to New York, she told me about this meeting and she, <laughs> she tried to get me to speak. When, I guess that was like two years ago or so. And I just, I was like, I don't know about these online meetings, man. I, I prefer the in-person meetings, not really trying to speak on the internet. And uh, here we are in the middle of pandemic and uh, it's all I've been doing. So um, anyway, it's good to be here. It's, it's great to be in this meeting finally. And happy birthday to all the birthdays. There's a lot of them. And welcome to all the new people. I think there's quite a few people that are under 30 days. So I'm, I'm really glad you all are here. Um, I'm sorry that, you know, you're getting sober in the middle of pandemic, but, you know, um, it is what it is. You know, I, 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 I haven't experienced that myself because I got sober like seven and a half years ago. And, you know, I was talking with someone the other day after one of these meetings and, and they're like, you know, they've been sober a few years as well. And they're like, oh, I couldn't imagine getting sober right now. I don't think I could do it. I mean, I, was, I don't think I can get sober. And, you know, everything in me wanted to agree with them. And be like, yeah, I, I couldn't get sober either. But, you know, I, there's just no way to tell. You know what I mean? Because I, I wasn't in that situation. I, I didn't get sober in the middle of pandemic. I got sober when there are in-person meetings going on all the time. There's fellowship all the time. Um, so it's really impossible for me to say, like, what would have happened to me if, if I chose to, get, chose to get sober at a time like this? And, um, you know, it's at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like God has removed the problem or God hasn't, you know, if, 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 you know, if it's my time to get sober, I'm going to get sober regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the fact that, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic or, or whatever's going on in the world. Like it's, if I need to get sober, it's going to happen. And so my hats, my hats off to those of you that have decided to get sober at this time and, and are committing and, and are coming to these online meetings as, as weird as they may seem. And, um, you know, I'm glad you're here. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of you also here that are very accustomed to these meetings. We've probably been going to them to, for quite a few years. And I know that this meeting's existed online way longer than the pandemic's been here. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate you all too, and 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 coming to this forum and, and bringing your sobriety with you here. Um, so yeah, I I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I've I was born and raised here. I've been here my whole life. Uh, I, I might <laughs> leave this city at some point, but you know, as of now, this this is where I'm staying for the time being, and you know, I'm pretty content here. And I know that there's a lot more to see in the world and hopefully you know I'll have the opportunity to do that but right now is not the best time for that so I'm just kind of hunkering down here and you know hitting these zoom meetings and, and all that so um, yeah I know I only have 20 minutes and there's a ton of people in this meeting so I, I want to you know get my story out there quick enough so I can hear other people so uh, I, I have a sobriety date it's November 13th 2012 I have a sponsor, I have a home group. We meet Monday nights at eight. It's the dubious luxury meeting. It uh, usually takes place here in St. Louis, but we are on Zoom for the time being. And I sponsor a few guys. So just like a quick drunk ox, I really, I really don't want to spend a lot of time talking about my drinking. It, it, it was horrible and it was awesome and it was amazing and it was fun and it was terrible. <laughs> all that stuff. And, you know, I, I came in when I needed to come in and, and, you know, luckily I stayed sober, but I will say that, you know, I had a lot of good times drinking. I had a lot of good times partying and, um, you know, the, the consequences got to the point where I, my hand was kind of forced. I had to make a decision whether I was going to live or die. And, you know, I, I chose life and AA was, was a choice for me. So, I started drinking right around the age 13, right from the start. I was a blackout drinker. Um, I don't think I've ever really had the ability to control my drinking. I know the first time it happened, you know, it was me and my friend kind of just like 
testing the waters, trying some different drinks. And before I knew it, I was really, really drunk, feeling really good and, and loving it and wanting to do that as often as I could. So that's what happened, you know, throughout high school, it's, it's pretty much my life. You know, I got the grades during the week, kind of flew under the radar with the parents and, you know, on the weekends went hard, you know, drinking, smoking weed, doing other drugs, um, you know, vandalizing, stealing, getting into trouble, getting arrested, all that stuff. And, you know, for me at the, at the time, it, it just seemed like it was normal high school stuff. You know, I was, I still had my life together for the most part. I was keeping good grades. I had good relationship with my friends, teachers, parents, family, and all that. So as long as that stuff was all good, I could keep basically doing what I wanted to do, which was drink as much alcohol as I possibly can get my hands on and <laughs> do whatever else was put in front of me. So that's what happened. You know, there were just a few consequences. I got arrested one night because we were all out, you know, in, in the suburbs and going around the, the different houses looking for garages that were open and stealing from the fridges in there. And, you know, we called it um, garage shopping, looking for alcohol. And eventually it escalated into stealing other stuff, me and, and a few friends. And eventually, you know, we came across this car and there was a sheriff deputy's gun in, in the lock block, uh, the Glock uh, Center Council. And I stole the sheriff deputy's gun um, and we got caught. And I was 16 at the time, so I, I pretty much got off scot-free, but my friend who was 17 got two felony charges. And, you know, I, I didn't think anything of it at the time. I thought, you know, I was more mad at him because he told the cops that I was the one who took the gun, um, even though I didn't get in any trouble. But this, that was just basically how it went. You know, I just did a lot of stupid things and did a lot of partying and didn't really, you know, care about the consequences. But after I graduated high school, you know, I had plans to go to college and all that and, and go to engineering school and uh, summer between high school and college, I pretty much had a mental breakdown and tried to kill myself, uh, jumped off a highway overpass, landed on the shore of the road, broke my back, went to the psych ward. I was in the psych ward for five weeks altogether and that was, I guess that was the first time that, because I, before that, I, I, I really did live a very sheltered life. You know, I come from a Irish Catholic family from St. Louis, you know, I didn't really experience much of the, of the real world and, you know, just kind of kept to my little group of friends and, you know, here I am 18 years old, just try to kill myself. And now I'm in a psych ward with a bunch of adults that have serious mental health issues and, you know, it was my first real exposure to like some of the harsher realities of life. And, you know, it was, it was really my first uh, kind of witnessing of, of alcoholism, um, not in myself, but in one of the other patients, he, he was, he kept coming in and out of because I was there for a while. So I, I saw a lot of what was going on. I got into the psych ward drama and got to know all the, the regulars. And there's this one guy that kept coming in and out because he couldn't stop drinking. And his skin had turned yellow from his, I guess, liver failure or something like that. And I just remember thinking like how horrible that was. But, you know, at the same time, the whole time I was in there, all I was thinking about was getting out so I can go get drunk. And, you know, eventually I did get out. And first thing I did was called up one of the guys I met in the psych ward. His name was Ed. And we met in a park and he got us got us a couple tall boys and that was the first thing I did so you know after that event I guess I guess I was kind of bitter and resentful towards God um I felt like I was you know given given a bad hand and you know I didn't deserve to have what happened to me like all that kind of stuff so I started drinking more deliberately um kind of more like, you know, I deserve to do this. I deserve to do whatever I want because I had to experience this horrible thing of, you know, basically losing my mind and trying to kill myself. 
So kind of like for the next two years or so, I, I, I was pretty much, you know, the, the book talks about, you know, being like alcoholic, being like a tornado that runs through people's lives. That was basically me for the next two years. Um, you know, I, I went away to college. I was, I was living on my own. And I just thought that I had the freedom. I thought I thought I was invincible. So, was, you know, I, I survived this, you know, epic suicide attempt and I can do whatever I want with no consequences and I can get away with anything. So basically, I just, you know, went hard with the drinking, um, went hard with risky behavior, did a lot of really, really stupid things, should have gotten killed several times. You know, I, I drove from St. Louis to Columbia, Missouri and a blackout once to go visit some of my friends at Mizzou, things like that. Um, and I, I never, never thought about, you know, how I would be affected, how others would be affected. And, and it just never crossed my mind. And, you know, I, I got in trouble a few times in college because I was just so crazy. You know, I, I, I threatened my roommate in, in my dorm, um, got kicked out of the dorm for that. I got banned from the dorm and actually got sent to an outpatient group that dealt with um, at addicts. And so that was kind of my first introduction to the steps. I was 19 at the time. So I was, you know, I mean, I got, I ended up getting sober at 20, but at 19, it was like, oh no, no, I'm, I'm way too young for this. Um, I don't have a problem with alcohol. Like my life's probably unmanageable, but that's not my fault. That's everyone else's fault. And this whole God thing is, is complete crap. It's not going to work out for me. God doesn't care about me. So I'm not going to rely on this higher power that, that you're talking about. So part of the outpatient group was we had to go to an AA meeting. So I went to this AA meeting um, I sat in the back with the other people from my treatment program, didn't get anything out of it, didn't really, you know, um, listen or anything like that. And as soon as the meeting was over, I left. And fast forward a year, basically, you know, I had pushed away everyone in my life. I had gotten in more trouble at school. Uh, my parents were done with me. My friends were done with me. I, I treated my friends horribly. And basically, you know, it, it came to the point where, well, I got sent to the psych ward again. I forgot about that. So I got in trouble and they sent me back to the psych ward. And as soon as I got out of the psych ward, once again, I, I went on another bender. It lasted about a week. I was going around town, basically just going and drinking wherever I can, trying to meet up with whoever I can, drinking by myself a lot. And by the end of that week bender, my parents basically caught up with me and I was kind of given an ultimatum. Um, well, I wasn't really given an ultimatum. I, I, my mom was like, you're going back to the psych ward. Like it's, this isn't negotiable. You're going to the psych ward. And I couldn't do it. I, I, I knew what would happen. You know, every time I had gone to the psych ward before I told them what they wanted to hear and said all the right things so that they let me go so I can go back to doing what I wanted to do, which was drinking, getting in trouble, all that stuff. So I knew that going to the psych ward wasn't going to work. And I knew that AA existed because I'd been to that one meeting before and my brother was also sober. Um, at this point, he would have been sober, I think, about two years. And my neighbors down the street had also been sober for like 20 years or whatnot. So, you know, I was sitting at my parents' kitchen table talking to my mom, and I was like, I'll get sober. I'll go to AA. And so, you know, that's what happened. It was, it was around Halloween of 2012, and... I remember my neighbor taking me to all the hot spots around St. Louis. I don't know if any of you have ever been to St. Louis, but we're a pretty big, you know, AA hub. I, I'm not going to lie. You know, we got a lot of history here with AA. In fact, the, the 12 concepts were codified in, in AA at the, at the international convention here. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of AA going on in, in St. Louis. So they brought me to some of the clubs around town and, and showed me some of the places and, you know, I, I started going to some meetings and 
getting to know some of the faces there, starting to get to know some of the lingo, hearing about this allergy of the body, obsession of the mind, ego, all this kind of stuff that I didn't really quite understand, but like part of me was like grabbing on a little bits and pieces here and there, kind of trying to piece it together. And I was doing it for a couple weeks and, um, you know, built some resentments towards some young people around here, which by the way, St. Louis has a really strong young people in AA group. It's, it's huge. Um, we have several young people meetings here. So, you know, I was, I was really lucky to, to get an AA in the city because I, I made some lifelong friends here, including Maria, who's now in New York. But, you know, um, anyway, just a little plug there for St. Louis. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so I got some resentment towards young people in AA because young people in AA suck sometimes. And I decided that I was going to get drunk. And so I was, I think I was at like one of the treatment centers for a meeting, like down in the hood. And I was going to walk home and I was like on my way home and I was like, you know what? I'm going to drink. I'm going to get drunk. And so I just, you know, went to a bar and did exactly exact, exact same hat thing happened that happened every other time I drank. I, you know, started with one beer, I started sipping the beer and suddenly, you know, I needed more. And this time I was able to, to, to see my, my disease in action. Um, I was able to see myself being com compelled to drink more and more and more. And, and, you know, I ended up at some, in some sketchy neighborhood, someone's house and whatever, blacking out and somehow making it home. And that's, that's one thing about me is like, no matter all the the things I did, the, the dangerous and risky things I did, I always managed to wake up the next morning in my bed. Um, lost my car quite a few times or came out to find Taco Bell cheese and lettuce all over my car or, or dings in my car from things I hit, but I always managed to make it back into my bed. So grateful for that. Um, so anyway, so that happened. And the next day I, you know, I had this hearing with my school because I had gotten in some trouble and they needed to figure out what they're going to do with me. And, you know, I was in this hearing and they're asking me all these questions and I had agreed that I wouldn't drink on campus, blah, blah, blah. They're like, okay, you signed this agreement, but you were drunk on campus. How do you explain that? And, you know, at that point, the, the puzzle pieces kind of came, came together and I admitted there to all these people and to myself, really, that I was an alcoholic. And I started crying and, you know, my mom was there with me. She was crying. My therapist was there. She was crying. And, you know, after that, you know, I was, it was just kind of like, I, I knew what I had to do. I, I had to come back here. And so, let me check the time. Okay. So I came back to AA. Um, I got a new sponsor, started working the steps. Um, started you know doing the deal you know did, did an honest this step was completely honest with him told him everything um you know told him all those things that i was i was ashamed about or thought i'd never tell anyone and it wasn't bad at all he laughed at me <laughs> and and kind of made a joke about some of the things i did and didn't didn't seem to care at all and you know shortly after that i i was lucky enough that you know i I was able to start sponsoring pretty early, you know, like I said, I got sober when I was 20 and um, I think I started sponsoring right around five months, which don't get me wrong. Like I, I had no idea what I was doing probably and probably shouldn't have been sponsoring people, but damn it, it, it got me through those first few months. Cause I was still really, really crazy. Um, I was bitter, resentful, full of fear, super lonely you know i i pretty much just kind of turned into a very antisocial person because of my drinking so like being suddenly thrust into this community of all these you know sober vibrant fun spiritual people i was like ah like i <laughs> too much and i was i would lash out and like get angry with people and yell at people and you know what the, the people in my life the people in these rooms they 
they stuck by me and, and they still supported me even through my crazy times. And slowly but surely, you know, I, I started to do more and more with the program. Like, like Maria said, you know, I got pretty heavily involved in service, um, started picking up the pieces of my life, went back to school, all this other stuff. And, you know, I kind of had a good rhythm in my AA life for probably the first six years or so. I, I didn't really, you know, I'm, I'm very agnostic. Um, I'm not a big God person. I'm not a big, you know, live on faith type of person. I'm, I'm very fact oriented and result oriented. And for a while, you know, I didn't really, I felt like I didn't really need to work on my spirituality because I was taking so much action. You know, I was, I was constantly working with newcomers. I was constantly showing up to meetings and, and sharing meetings or doing other service work, district level service work, whatever it was. I was always very active in AA. So it was easy for me to kind of just do that kind of stuff and kind of put the God stuff and the spiritual stuff on the back burner and just kind of like not deal with it. Right. So that worked for a while. And then um, something happened near the end of 2018. I was, I was under a lot of stress at that time. I had, I was in law school, I was working a new job. I was trying to juggle all this stuff. I had just moved to a new place um, with some people that kind of were annoying. And there's just a lot of changes in my life at that time. And I felt terrible. Like I, I, I had like, it was like a bottom, I bottomed out in sobriety. And that was from probably November of 18 until probably February of 19. And I came out of that and it's, it was almost like I was reborn. It was like, everything was different for me. Like my entire sobriety had to change. And I realized how important a higher power is and how important, you know, it is for me to, to tap into that spirituality, to rely on that spirituality and, 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 and use that for, as my rock. Um, because up to that point, I, I'd always relied on basically my actions and doing things. And I think like the entire time, all the service work and all the stuff I was doing was really just distracting me from myself. You know, I, I wasn't really quite ready to look at myself and, and it was just so easy to just go, go, go and do, do, do. And, you know, eventually it all came crashing down on me and I had to really look at myself and, and, and realize that like, I don't really love myself. Um, and that's a problem because I have to live with myself my entire life. I have to live with my choices. I have to live with the space and this everything. Um, and I have to somehow find a way to be okay and content with that. And, you know, hitting that bottom made me realize that the only way I can be okay with myself is if I somehow build a relationship with a higher power. And for me, you know, everyone's higher power is different, but you know, that I think that, that God resides in all of us. Like we, we have that spiritual energy within us and it's always there. It's, it's, it's infinite. And, you know, if I can calm myself enough and center myself, I can tap into that and I can stay there no matter where I'm at. You know, I can, I can live in that peace. I can live in that calm. Um, and it's always present and, and it's, it's so easy for me to forget that exists because I am a person that's always going, going, going and doing, doing, doing. And, and I, I ignore that. And, you know, when I'm silent, when I'm still, and when I'm working the steps, you know, doing the steps and, and all that, it, it gets me to a place of stillness. I can tap into that spirituality. And, you know, I realize you know, that when I'm, when I'm using that, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. It doesn't matter where I'm working, who I'm with, what I'm doing, you know, I can be peace and I can be content. Um, but it, it, it requires working the steps and it requires really, you know, tapping into that 11 step. You know what I mean? Like really finding out or asking whatever your higher power is to, for its will and, and the power to carry that out. And, you know, the, the meaning of the 11th step 
probably didn't become that apparent to me until recently. Like it, it tells me right there in the step, like how I'm supposed to pray and how I'm supposed to utilize my higher power. Um, so it's really simple, but you know, as a human, I, I get wrapped up in ego. I get wrapped up in fear and, and I ignore that part of myself. Um, and that's where I run into trouble. So the more I can tap into that part of myself instead of the alcoholic, fearful, obsessive, um, angry part, the better off I am. So I got the note from Maria that I need to wrap up. So I will end it on that. So thanks.